Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. Um, and she is a legal scholar and civil rights advocate and a former um, director of um, ACLU programs, specifically combating racial discrimination by law enforcement. Um, and essentially the overall conclusion that she comes to in her book is that mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow, um, meaning legalized segregation and discrimination against black people specifically. Um, one of her biggest points is that a lot of people have a very rose-tinted glasses idea of um, racial equality and discrimination and um, that even advocates tend to ignore mass incarceration as an issue of racism. Um, um, and, you know, we've talked about this a lot in class, like the the um, wrongly directed idea that the civil rights movement brought complete equality, especially when talking about um, white people who tend to believe that racism is just an issue of personal discrimination and just societal discrimination instead of based within institutions. Um, and she, she starts this book out by talking about how she, while working with the ACLU, was confronted with this idea of mass incarceration being um, an epidemic and um, a part of systematic racism, and she didn't believe it. Um, and it took her a long time to finally start digesting these ideas that people were incarcerated unfairly and black people were targeted by law enforcement outside of like the police brutality that she was aware of and the discrimination that she was working with the ACLU on combating. Um, I thought uh, the, the New Jim Crow was interesting because it reminded me of some of the themes that James Baldwin talked about in The Fire next time. Um, both of the authors talk about the lack of conversations in the proper institutions. Um, so James Baldwin wrote his book as the Civil Rights Movement was still happening, and he talked about how there wasn't, there still wasn't enough social conversation surrounding racism and discrimination, um, and Michelle Alexander says a similar thing, but also says that there's a lack of conversation within scholarship and also even within advocacy. Um, and there's a huge focus in the book on Reagan's war on drugs. Um, that's a theme that drives basically the entire book, this analysis of essentially crack cocaine being planted in neighborhoods that were majority black. Um, and she goes into a really deep analysis on statistics regarding who was using cocaine at that point in time and why crack was discriminated against uh, in rock form instead of in powder form, which was much more prevalent among white communities and seen much more as a party drug, a concept I'm sure we're all familiar with um, having gone through this class. Um, but in her analysis of mass incarceration being the new Jim Crow, she says that there's something, one of the big things that separates the original Jim Crow and the new Jim Crow is like one of my fellow students talked about coded language. Um, and she talks about how um, language within politics and social conversation um, and also this idea of colorblindness socially contributes to upholding the new Jim Crow. Um, and additionally, she says that um, the new Jim Crow actually feeds upon an idea of, big air quotes around this, like model black citizens and this idea, um, she says that um, the new Jim Crow feeds on the idea that some people have, like for an example, Barack Obama being elected president is the keystone of racial equality. There is no more racism because America has had a black president. And she makes a big point to talk about how ideas like these and ideas like affirmative action um, in colleges being the last step to ending discrimination in another field, how these things are really big um, issues when it comes to colorblindness, it drives colorblindness, therefore, again, driving the new Jim Crow. Um, and she also talks about how, so, sorry, I have a lot of notes and I wrote them all out of order. Um, another big point that she talks about that she brings up continuously is this idea of a caste system within racism. Um, and she goes beyond so traditionally when we think of caste systems, we think of um, financial and social standing based on 
monetary value. Um, and so she coins this term and she refers to it as an undercast. And an undercast to her is when a stigmatized racial group is locked into an inferior position by law. Um, and therefore, you know, social discrimination and legal discrimination continue to escalate the problem of racism because they are made legal and acceptable socially. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, and she also talks about um, this caste system being, and this is a quote from the book, a comprehensive and well-disguised system of social control, which functions like Jim Crow, another example of how it's the new Jim Crow. Um, and uh, mass incarceration, she says, is also um, a big part of the new Jim Crow is supporting this idea that people of color are inferior. There's another big focus on um, not only the stigma of like being involved in illegal activities, like the idea behind it, but also the legal repercussions that come when somebody is released from prison, how in a lot of ways people are not treated as human when they are felons. They're denied access to things like food stamps and um, other social welfare programs as well. Um, and this is another big driving force be um, behind her philosophy around the oppression specifically. This book focuses a lot on African American men who have been in prison because that's an overwhelmingly high statistic of the black community that is in prison. She estimates um, through several cases and statistics um, that if the US prison system continues to grow the way that it is, one third of black men will have been in prison at some point in their life. Um, something that was interesting to read so the, the book has a lot of strengths. It's really well sourced. She's done so much research. The index in the back is huge. I think that her experience with the ACLU and other um, organizing really shines in this. It was really interesting to read Dissent to the book. Um, specifically, so James Foreman Jr. is um, a Yale law professor who spent six years being a public defender and focused on helping um, children that were going to be incarcerated, children that were going to be in juvenile detention, and then also black men that were going to be incarcerated. Um, and he published an analysis that made me have so many feelings. Um, well, and there's so much information in this book that reading the dissent was kind of difficult and uncomfortable in a way, if that makes sense. Um, but essentially, um, Foreman talks about how Alexander's book neglects to analyze the complete history of the establishment of mass incarceration. So she does talk about um, like the building of high capacity prisons and she talks about how um, her research indicates that they were a direct response to the social uh, or to the civil rights movement and um, a direct response also to Reagan's war on drugs and the not so much conspiracy theory that it was more or less planned and used to target people of color. Um, and while Foreman says that a lot of her research is correct, he says that Alexander neglects to analyze the really the dramatic spike in violent crime at the same time that high capacity prisons were being built. Um, and um, also says that she she neglects to um, tap into her research behind African American voters that supported high capacity prisons and stricter laws when it came to drug possession and other felonies. Um, John Pfaff um, also criticized the percentages that she presented with the um, the percentages of black men that were in prison for drug offenses. He said that she neglected to analyze um, um, again, like she neglected to analyze violent crime in association to drugs. Um, and his dissent was a little more complicated, but it was, it was kind of confusing, and I kind of struggled to pit the or put the two sources next to each other between Foreman and Alexander because also I felt like with Foreman's argument there there's always the idea that statistics can be skewed and especially when we're talking about racism it's really hard to 
quantify racism in research, it's really hard to get exact numbers. And so, like, even if he is saying that she's neglected to analyze certain things, like, it, it's also quite probable that he's missing things in his research. Um, I would say that a weakness of the book is definitely that it's for people that are already interested in anti-racism work and anti-racism education. She states it in like the first three pages of her book that she's not writing to change people's minds. She's not writing her book as an introductory course, that she's writing specifically for people who want to educate themselves further and seek action against racism. Um, but overall, I, I would really recommend it. I think it's a really important analysis. And even, I mean, even the people that wrote these sort of dissents against her book recognized that her information was correct, that mass incarceration is a crisis. It affects especially black men and is really damaging to society as a whole because racism is damaging as a whole to everybody. Um, so overall, I would say it's really strong. Again, it's really well researched and I think it's a really important conversation to have. And I think that's it, if anybody has any questions. Yeah. All right, so you just said, like, um, the book is meant for the people who um, would like to gain more info to take action. Does she <laughs> mention any sort of process that we would need to go through to combat the mass incarceration? No, and I'm really glad that you mentioned that. That was something that I neglected, I couldn't really find in her book, is I think mostly the point of her writing this book, I think, was to present all of this information and kind of call out this inadequacy of conversation, because that was a huge focus for her, was that civil rights organizations do not recognize mass incarceration the way she thinks they should, um, that they don't talk about how harmful mass incarceration is, and rather that a lot of um, civil rights organizations focus on upholding affirmative action type movements. Um, and while they do focus on like hate crimes and other things, again, there's like hardly any focus on mass incarceration on a large scale. Um, I'm kind of curious. So within her research, does she focus more on statistics and kind of big themes, or does she delve into personal stories or cases? Or um, she references a lot of legal cases, but it doesn't really take a narrative form. It's much mm -hmm. more research based. But um, the interesting part of that, though, is it's, it's, it's pretty digestible. Um, I wasn't tripped up on a lot of things. Um, she outlined a lot of things. Well, she really well explained the war on drugs specifically, which like I had some background knowledge on, but she presented really helpful information that, again, was just backed up by really great sourcing. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I am trying to. Like, I've, I've read the book, but it, it's been a while, and one of my professors was telling me that, and I can't remember the name of the author, that there is a book that was written by a Native woman that is kind of similar to this, just in the sense of, like, calling out mass incarceration, um, like, particularly affecting Native people. Um, and so then I was trying to remember, like, does she talk about other groups? Because I know she talks about people of color, but what sort of, like, intersectionality is looked at? She, it, it's mostly in passing, it, it's kind of this idea, like, it affects all people of color in some way, but the focus is definitely on yeah. black people, and specifically black men, and the effects that um, the war on drugs had on um, rates of incarceration for black men specifically. Um, it's definitely more in passing, although she does recognize that it's not just black people that are affected by mass incarceration. Do you think the book deserves the accolades it's been received? And this book is one of the most widely read texts about institutional racism we have in contemporary America today. When I first read, like when I, when I finished it before I started reading about some of the dissents about it, I would say yes. Some of the things I've read kind of make me question it. I completely agree. It's really important. So much of it is super accurate. It's or so much of it is accurate. Um, and I mean, I've heard there are um, like Ivy League schools that require first year students to read the new Jim Crow. I think that's really important. Um, I don't know if it's maybe just the history major in me that says, you know, whenever you read anything, you have to read other things in conjunction to it to try and fully understand it. I would say it's really important. 
I think it, it deserves I de it deserves a lot of praise, but my criticism is that a lot of the reviews about it might not have been um, made having read the book in conjunction with other sources, if that makes sense. Well, sometimes the best sign of a book's success is how vociferous its critics are. Yeah. And I think that's probably part of what's going on here, that they're being critical because it's gotten the attention and because a good book yeah. is worthy of really rigorous critics. That's true. And I, a lot of the criticisms that I read, they were all yes, but. Mm -hmm. And I think that the yes there is still important. Right. Um, the, the big consistent criticism I saw was her lack of acknowledgement of violent crime and the correlation it has to mass incarceration. Yeah. It's, it's very significant. Anything else, Representative? Round of applause. Thank you.